Hello, and welcome to You Media Chicago Speak On It, a series of author talks virtually connecting teens to successful writers for conversations and books about writing, creativity, and more. I am Jaime, your Chai Town Teen Librarian and co-chair of Latinx Heritage Committee at Chicago Public Library. I'm very excited today to welcome our guest, Fred Aceves. Fred is the author of The Closest I've Come, which is a Kirkus Best Book of 2017, and the new David Espinosa, which came out this year in February. Fred was born in New York to a Mexican father and Dominican mother. He spent most of his youth in Southern California and Tampa, Florida. At the age of 21, he started traveling around the world, living in Chicago, New York, the Czech Republic, France, Argentina, Bolivia, and Mexico. He has worked as a delivery driver, server, cook, car salesman, freelance editor, and teacher of English as a second language. He is published by HarperCollins, Apart from writing and editing, he now works as a speaker and runs creative writing workshops. All right, thank you for joining us, Fred. Thank you for having me. This is great. Yeah. Now, before we begin, uh, please let me remind everyone tuning in uh, to submit your questions in the chat box, and I'll go ahead and ask them on your behalf. So let's get started. Um, first, I'll, I'll ask the question. Um, uh, so I worked with a few teens who came up with this question and I promised I would ask them. They're planning a literary festival in, for November in Chicago. Um, and they wanted to know, uh, please describe Fred as a teen. Uh, what was he into? Um, were he already into writing? And like, did you have any mentors at that time? Right, so how was I as a teen? I was, um, I was quite sociable, um, but at the same time shy. I like to spend you know, time alone. Um, I was obsessed with basketball um, and uh, hip hop music. I mean, this is something my friends and I you know, had in common. Um, and well, writing, no, writing wasn't part of my life. Reading wasn't part of my life. You know, I was a very bad student um, uh, throughout you know, junior high, and in high school, I, I barely got by, you know, I, um, I often had to take uh, summer classes to make up for, for the classes um, uh, during the year. And I ended up getting held back uh, as a junior because I failed too many classes, you know. Um, you know, I didn't take school very seriously. Um, and, uh, you know, I wasn't a reader, you know. Um, I didn't even read the books that were given to me. You know, that, that's, I was, you know, just a terrible, terrible student. Um, and uh, I eventually, well, I had to drop out um, when I was 17 in order to, to work a second job. And, and when that happened, I remember, you know, it's, there, there's that cliche that you don't know what you have until it's gone, you know? And like a lot of cliches, you know, it's the truth. <laughs> so when I was working at second job, you know, working my two jobs, I started thinking, well, you know what, school wasn't that bad, you know? But yeah, I, um, so yeah, I, uh, I arrived at writing and reading uh, very late. Yeah. yeah. When, when did you know you wanted to write? When was that moment? Um, because you've said that you had trouble like with reading and writing and weren't that interested. When was the moment that you, felt like I'm going to write professionally? Wow, it's hard to say because I suppose like within the first couple years, by the time I was 20, um, I thought it'd be really cool to be an author, you know? Um, but it was still just an aspiration, you know? I wasn't actually writing, you know? Um, and this is a problem that a lot of young writers have, you know, they call themselves aspiring writers. like. And, and there's no such thing as an aspiring writer. You can be an aspiring author. You can aspire to get published, but you don't have to be, you don't aspire to, to write, you know? You either write or you don't, you know? Like you can, you can start writing like right now, you know? You can stop watching this and start writing, you know? And, and you're a writer, right? So I didn't start writing seriously until, uh, well, apart from, I, I, I would write a lot of, I would write a lot of journal entries I made two attempts at short stories that I never revised. Um, I, I expected them to come out perfectly, I guess, on the first try or, or, or quite good. I didn't realize that all first drafts are horrible. 
Um, and I even attempted um, a novel, which was very sloppy and done in a few months, which I ended up just dumping. Um, and, but it taught me that I had a lot to learn, you know? So I would say about, yeah, about 12, 13 years ago, um, I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina at the time, and I joined a, a writer's group there. There were about seven of us, yeah? We were called uh, Wednesdays with Wine. We even had a, a gang sign, right? <laughs> So the, it would start with the critique and then it would end with wine. And that was the first time. I mean, it, I started writing seriously then because I had my writing group to, to hold me accountable. You know, I had to show up with something on Wednesday, you know, before this, this is what's so hard to write. You know, this is why it's so hard to, to actually write because, you know, we have a lot of fear, you know, and we also say, what's the point? You know, it's not going to be very good. And, you know, who's going to read it? You know, like no one's, it's one of the hardest things that we can do. And no, there's no supervisor, you know, like looking over our shoulder, making sure we're getting it done, right? So that writer's group is really what helped, what would help me, you know, be accountable. It helped me to write consistently. Um, that's when I started, you know, I started with the, with the short stories. I ended up showing, you know, uh, like a TV script that I was working on. And, you know, those small encouragements that I got, you know, um, you know, we're like little, little pushes, you know, and saying, hey, you can do this, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I discovered that I did have a unique perspective, you know, because of my, you know, unique life, and um, I was developing skills as a writer, and all those things told me that, you know, this is, this is something you can actually do. Yeah, um, so uh, you did talk a little bit about, like, your education experience, like education system. Um, and I did read on the Bent Agency that you attended five different high schools before dropping out and getting your GED. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you tell us like maybe like the importance of like mentorship? Cause like when you went to Bolivia um, or Buenos Aires, I believe uh, you said that you had that support group uh, for writing and, and, and things like, so what's like the importance of mentorship? Well, the importance of mentorship is, you know, you need, you need feedback, you know, as, as a writer, um, you know, to do it on your own, it takes a very long time. You know, sometimes you write something, you put it away, right? And when you revisit it, you can see the glaring mistakes, you know, but what about all those other things, you know? Um, uh, you know, so when I showed my work to, to, to this writer's group, I got, you know, great constructive criticism. I, I, I learned, you know, what I was doing right, what I was doing wrong. I mean, of course you can't take all the criticism you receive. You know, there, there are people who are just plain wrong, but you know, it was a pretty good, it was a pretty big group. And yeah, if, if two or more people are saying the same thing, then it's something, you know, that, that you have to look at, you know? Um, and as far as, as uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see them as, as my teachers. You know, and as my mentors, that's what we were doing, you know, that, yeah, that we were helping each other in that way. And, um, and uh, yeah, I know some people get it from, from MFA programs, you know, um, you know, there's, it's, it's a question I've gotten before. It's like, you know, do you think MFA programs, you know, are, 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 are a good idea? I can't say that because, you know, I never went to, I never did one, but um I suspect that the reason so many writers make great strides on their craft in their craft when uh, in MFA programs, that it's not because you know the the college professors there have these you know have these uh, secrets on, on you know they have these this this like writing wisdom you know and these secret writing tips that are absent in, in books of craft. I, I really think it's because these writers are writing more than ever and they're and they're getting constructive. Criticism, sure, some comes from the professor, but um, a lot of it comes from from their classmates, you know. And uh, and I do and I do believe in a in a, you know in in a writers group, you know. I do believe in sharing uh, one's work and and getting that feedback. Um, every author that I know um, has beta readers before they send it out to their editor, you know. And then the editor provide provides even more feedback. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm all for mentorship. And on the topic of feedback and like criticism, I know you just mentioned like that 
sometimes the criticism can be wrong or and right. Um, mm -hmm. How do you how do you deal with that? Like, because writing is so personal. Um, and when do you feel like your intuition? You're like, well, I'm gonna go for it for what I wrote and like put that criticism aside or feedback. Right, right, right. Well, I think. I don't think you have to take it as, oh, this is wrong because they say it's wrong, but it does raise a question. It should raise a question. You know, I believe that, uh, uh, that, that any story we write should be as good as possible, right? And we should be able to justify every chapter in a book, every scene and every line mm -hmm. and every paragraph, you know? So if someone points out a problem, you know, all I have to do as a writer is, 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 you know, really, you know, step back and look at it is like, okay, is this serving the story? Mm -hmm. And if I can justify it to myself, then, then that's enough. Yeah, that's good mm -hmm. advice. Um, so you traveled quite a bit. Um, could you share with us like your experiences and some of the things you learned and still carry today? Wow, well, I learned a lot. Um, and what's really great about traveling is that, you know, especially when you're young, you know, and, you know, those formative years, you know, um, uh, because I do believe the formative years continue, you know, uh, in, in, into the twenties, you know, um, it's not just teenagers going through, you know, huge transformations. I know a lot of people in college, you know, do, do the same thing. Um, and, uh, I think what's really great is that you show up. Right? One of the reasons I wanted to travel, uh, you know, it, I wasn't just looking for adventure, you know. Um, I was also looking to escape, you know. I wanted to escape those things that shaped me as an adolescent, you know. I wanted to get out of Florida and then I wanted to get out of the United States. Um, and one of the really great things is when you travel is nobody knows who you are, mm -hmm. you know. It's like you're, you're anonymous. You know, and I remember, you know, I never pretended to be something I wasn't, you know, but I remember trying new things, you know, I remember giving myself over to the culture and then instead of resisting things, you know, oh, this is weird, you know, I went with it. And there are a lot of things that I got from various cultures that, you know, um, that, yeah, I mean, that, that, that have shaped who I am now. Like one of the things I got, uh, like, 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 like all Americans, I remember uh, the biggest meal I had in the day was, was was dinner. You know, most countries don't do that. You know, the big meal is lunch. You know, at lunch. So now I have a big lunch and I have a small. You know, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of things I can talk about. Um, but the, but but one of the things that's often overlooked when people travel. I mean, we know we that you, you discover a lot and your understanding of the world is broadened. But what a lot of people don't, don't mention is that um, our, our perception of our own home country changes too, right? Because we have a basis of comparison, you know? Yeah. And I found myself very often saying, rather than saying, wow, this is weird about this country, I was thinking, wow, the United States is really weird, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like the United States has this all wrong, you know? And, you know, obvious things like, you know, like universal health care, but less obvious things, you know, like, like how, how we socialize and, you know, and, and how we eat our meals and, you know, things like that. Yeah, it's good to see like the difference um, and definitely opens your perspective. Um, and I'll lead to with this que other question that someone uh, just asked, um, where is your favorite place to travel and how does traveling inspire your writing? Oh, thanks for that question. Um, my favorite place to travel. Well, you have to understand when I was traveling, um, I was actually just moving to new countries, mm. you know, not knowing, you know, anybody necessarily. And so I wasn't going for a vacation, you know, yeah. um, I never had any money. Um, and in fact, I didn't have money when I started, you know, traveling when I left Florida. I mean, I, I, rem I remember, you know, I, I was very poor and, think, you know, you know, one day I might travel and I was like, no, actually I can be poor anywhere, you know, <laughs> so I would just end up moving, you know, um, I, I ended up moving, yeah, to, to, to Chicago, which I miss, and then, and then New York. 
and then Prague and I would always get a job right away, you know? So it's not like I ever, you know, traveled uh, for, for pleasure, for fun. And I actually never returned to any of these countries with the exception of Mexico, you know? I, you know, I, something told me, he's like, hey, you should, you know, you should, you should move to another country, you know, country, you know uh, somewhere you haven't been. But then after a few years, I would move back to Mexico, mm-hmm. you know, and because I missed it, you know, and then, so the third time I came back, I told myself, it's like, well, you know, maybe this is the place, you know, where, where I'll end up living. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my answer would be Mexico. <laughs> okay. I was born there. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. You took the Puebla, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, let's uh, talk a little bit about your first book. Um, so what was your inspiration for writing your first book, The Closest I Come? And how has uh, some of the feedback you received from young people, and what was some of the feedback you received from young people? Right. Um, well, the inspiration, um, I was thinking a lot about my adolescence. You know, I think a lot of us do. Um, there are certain things that happen in our adolescence that we spend our whole lives trying to overcome. You know, it's a very important time of our lives. But I was thinking a lot about my adolescence at the time and all, and all my friends. Um, I remember reading, um, you know, uh, learning that one of my friends um, went back to jail. You know, four out of, out of my 10 closest friends went to jail before they were 19 years old, you know? And, and I learned about this when I was trying to, you know, reconnect with them. And I was thinking about, you know, who we were, um, you know, when, 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 you know, we were 15, 16, you know, 17 years old, you know, um, before things got awful. And, um, and I really wanted to understand that time, you know? Now, this book is not, is not about, you know, myself or, you know, any of these friends, but these friends have seen themselves in some of the characters, you know, they're like composites of everybody, you know? Um, what I wanted to do it, when I first started out is I wanted to write about a neighborhood. It was almost like the neighborhood was the main character, mm-hmm. yeah? I think I was influenced by, by Mahfouz, you know, who's, who's written, <clears throat> who's written, you know, he's an Egyptian writer uh, who's written many books, uh, uh, who wrote many books. Um, uh, one, one book is uh, Mirak Ali, and it's about, you know, various apartments in an alley, and we see the lives of these different people. Um, that's what my first draft looked like, and that's what I thought, you know, the book was going to be. Of course, there was no story, and I like books with story. So then Marcos really got my attention. You know, and I said, you know, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be uh, my main character. So I sort of stumbled upon, you know, the story. I was trying to write about an entire neighborhood and ended up writing about, about Marcos. Mm-hmm. And the second part of the question, you, you asked about what the feedback I've gotten. Yeah, um, like what was some of the feedback um, from young, young people about yeah. the book? Let me tell you the feedback um, has been great because uh, what they say is that, you know, they feel seen, Mm -hmm. you know, they say, I can identify with with what's going on, you know, with these boys, that's how I felt. You know, I felt trapped in my emotions. You know, I didn't talk about things, you know. Um, A lot of them said, this is the first book that I've ever read, you know, and they asked me for book recommendations, you know. And this, I had no idea that this would be like the greatest part of, of, of being an author, you know, meeting these young people and, and creating readers, you know? Um, and, and I just think about, you know, my younger self and, you know, how I fell in love with reading, you know, when I chose my own books, you know, when I was 18 and how I would have read a lot sooner, most likely, um, if I'd seen myself reflected in those books, you know, um, that's why I love the fact that there's that in, in both of my po- books, the character, you know, in both cases, Latinx character um, is on that cover. I think I would have opened a book if I saw, you know, someone like me on the cover. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in February, um, the new David Espinosa was released, and we just mentioned. Uh, your new published book. 
could you share with us um, why this book is important for young people to read? Um, and yes, yeah. Um, I think it's important. Well, I think it's a good story. And I think all good stories sh uh, sh should be read. Um, I didn't write it with, with, with any particular intention. I just wanted to talk about the truth of uh, body dysmorphia, you know, um, and how it affects uh, boys and men. Um, we have quite a lot of stories um, in books and in movies and in TV shows about eating disorders, you know, uh, uh, you know, anorexia and bulimia, uh, which affects, you know, mostly girls and women, right? But we don't have any of these stories for boys. And this is like an, 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 an invisible, you know, almost epidemic. Yeah. Um, a recent study says that 22% of boys and you know, of men between 18 and, and, and 20, 24 years old show signs of disordered eating related to, to you know, building muscle. Um, you know, I've been, you know, uh, I've been going to the gym for about 13, about 13 years, you know, without any intention of, you know, being a bodybuilder or anything just to be fit. But this is something that I've seen, you know, all around me, you know, these, these, the, these boys and these men um, become obsessed, you know, and they developed, you know, disordered eating habits, you know, they, they feel very you know, proud of themselves when they, you know, eat, you know, broccoli and, and drink their protein shakes because that's conducive to building muscle and, and they feel deep shame, you know, when they, when they, you know, eat pizza or, or French fries and like nobody's talking about this, you know, growing up, I remember, you know, I, I remember being around this, being around, you know, women and girls who were, who seemed, you know, obsessed and, um, and, and, you know, with, with, with how they looked, you know, I remember a couple of girlfriends making comments, you know, like, you know, we're about to go to the, the beach, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, you know, and they might say, oh, I look horrible, you know, or, uh, oh, I shouldn't be wearing a, you know, a bathing suit. And, um, and I remember, you know, it's like, it's like, what a horrible, you know, why, you wouldn't say that, you know, to somebody else. Imagine saying that, you know, imagine saying you look horrible, you shouldn't wear, you know, you're a sweet and caring person. And the one time you choose to be a jerk, it's to yourself, you know, mm -hmm. like what's wrong with you. And so I actually showed signs of this is disordered eating about two years into, you know, uh, joining the gym. It was, I remember I hopped on a scale like a few days in a row. I was like, oh, you know, you know, did I, did I, did I not lose weight or excuse me, did I, did I not, you know, build muscle, you know, um, you know, I ate a few things maybe I shouldn't have, have eaten. I'm supposed to do 10, 10 repetitions of a hundred today uh, because I did, you know, uh, eight, you know, during the last workout and and, um, and then, you know, feeling bad about myself when I didn't, you know, reach those goals. And I just remember I snapped out of it. I was like, what, you know, what am I doing here? You know, I remember those conversations, you know, I've had, and, you know, all the things I've witnessed. And, and I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. You know, um, you know my self-worth comes from, you know, who I am as a person, you know, how I treat others, you know, it doesn't come from, you know, how many bench presses I can do or, you know, what I had for lunch, you know? And, um, and yeah, I just, I just wanted to talk about, you know, this problem, um, something I've, I've seen in other people. And it's a story that, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a story you hear again and again um, when you, you know, when you talk to, to bodybuilders and, you know, boys and men in general who go, who go to the gym, but, um, you know, I've never encountered it. In, 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 in fiction. Yeah. Um, so talking about like writing your books and like, let's talk a little bit about your creative process uh, about writing them. Um, there's a question here. Um, what is your work schedule like when writing and um, how do you create these main characters? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, great, great question. So, um, so, now, okay, so it's hard to, to stick to my schedule because um, as, a, as a society, we've, we've decided that um, socializing should take place 
you know, at night, you know, like after eight or after nine. Honestly, when I like to be in bed reading by nine and sometimes I'm asleep by 9.30 or 10, you know, that's my ideal schedule. But that changes, you know, when I want to go out to dinner with some friends, you know, I want to go to a party. So, um, yeah, so this started actually when I wrote my first, the first draft of the, uh, of the closest I've come. Um, I had many distractions. Um, I, was, I was living in La Paz, Bolivia. Um, I couldn't find a writer's group, not enough people interest, interested in, in, in doing something like that in English, right? I wrote in English only. So, um, and there were a lot of distractions. Uh, it was really hard to do the work that I had to do. So I physically removed myself from those distractions and I moved to the jungle a few hours away to the edge of the jungle, it's uh, Los Yungas. And, um, and there I rented a, you know, a cabin and I stayed there for about 11 months. I would sometimes go back to La Paz for a weekend or whatever. And yeah, I remember going to bed at nine because there was nothing else to do. You know, it got dark and it's like, you know, <laughs> might as well. And I learned that I worked better in the morning. Mm -hmm. So that's a schedule that I like to keep. I like to wake up at, you know, 4.30 or five in the morning if possible, no later than six. And I like to get to work right away. Um, and uh, I'll work for a few hours. And then I'll, I'll go out and, and get some physical, you know, exercise. Nowadays, I'm, you know, I do TRX on my, on my, on my roof, you know, I, uh, and, you know, sometimes I'll go for a run and it's a nice little break. Then I'll come back and work a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, that's pretty much my schedule. And then, and then uh, my afternoons are free for, uh, are free to, to do, to do reading to do all the business side of, of being an author, you know, sending, e you know, responding to emails and, you know, things like that. Um, and as far as, uh, yeah, you asked about the characters. Um, yeah, well, I start, I start with character. You know, I don't start with ideas. I start with a character. Um, a character just, just comes to me. And I become, um, lots of characters came to me in, in, in the closest I've come, which is right. I developed, you know, so many of their, of, of, of their stories. Um, and I don't really know where I'm going. You know, I'm just curious about the main character and, um, and slowly, you know, it's, you know, the first draft is a process of, of discovery. You know, you don't know where you're going. You just write and, and, and go where the writing leads. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I discover the story after the first draft. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think um, Marcos, uh, the main character, closest I've come, and David from the new David Espinosa, if they met, would they be friends? What a great question. Um, they would be friends, but that's before David Espinosa starts taking steroids and his personality. Well, you know, his, his, uh, his priorities, you know, um, shift, you know, completely. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but um, yeah, like, you know, David, you know, uh, you know, I've, I've heard some people say, you know, I don't like David very much. Yeah, you're not, yeah. He's, <laughs> I think he's a great guy in the beginning, but yeah, he's not very likable at, at, at one point of the novel. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody would like David at that point. But 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 uh, would they be friends? Yeah, before and after uh, the steroid cycle that David takes. Yeah, definitely. I think so. Cool. Um, all right. So as you might know, we are celebrating uh, Latinx Heritage Month from September fifteenth uh, to October fifteenth. Um, what would you like to see more or believe is missing uh, in Latinx uh, young YA? Wow, um, I would say I would say everything. I would say everything, you know, because um, there are so many, you know, uh, we have so many stories, you know, featuring, um, you know, uh, you know, white main characters. White main characters are allowed to do whatever they want to do, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but with Latin characters often, and this doesn't just happen in, in the book industry, it happens in movies and TV shows, you know, we sort of have to justify the character being, you know, Latinx, 
You know, it's like, why is he in that next? I don't get it. You know, like it would be, it would be difficult to write about, I don't know, like a couple, you know, hunters that are Latinx, you know, getting lost in the woods, you know, people would be like, you know, the gatekeepers who say, you know, which stories can be told and which don't uh, get accepted, you know, might say, you know, why, you know, why is this character Latinx? I don't get it. You know, does, you know, the, the, he doesn't eat a burrito in, in, in the forest, you know, he doesn't dance outside at any point, you know, but for instance, there are, you know, there are Latinx people who, you know, who, who, who hunt, you know, who ski, who do all these things. So I'd like to see uh, more, I'd like to see any story that, that doesn't, you know, uh, maintain, you know, stereotypes, you know? Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, but just to be clear, when we talk about like maintaining stereotypes, we're talking about, you know, actual, you know, like, um, well, one stereotype, I'm talking about stereotypes like as secondary characters, you know, because so often when, when we appear in stories, you know, Latinx people are like either holding a rake or a broom, you know, that sort of thing, you know, but there's nothing wrong with centering those characters. In fact, I, I, I haven't come across, you know, many stories that, that feature a domestic worker, you know, for example, but tell the story from the point of view of that domestic worker, you know, don't, don't make him or her a secondary character, you know, so what's missing? Yeah, and any story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're about wrapping up. Uh, I do want to ask this last question. Uh, what books are you excited about or currently reading uh, right now that you'd like to share with us? Wow, okay. So <laughs> here's the thing. This, this question usually gives me anxiety because I, you know, people want to know what kind of books I, I like or, you know, what I'm reading. And I always fail to mention it. As soon as the talk finishes, I realize like, how can I not mention, you know, these two or three authors? So I was, I actually have a list. I have a little list I jotted, I jotted down here. And I decided to focus on, on Latinx writers because it's Latinx Heritage Month. And, you know, the, the culture is putting the spotlight on, on you know, on us, and I want to keep uh, the spotlight there. So I'm just going to name some 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 writers uh, I've read recently, um, and whose work I, I really love: uh, Nonieka Ramos, Adi Al Said, Elizabeth Acevedo, Ernesto Cisneros, Jenny Sanchez Torres, Victor Gonzalez, um, Benjamin Ali de Sainz, Meg Medina, Evie Zaboy, Aida Salazar, and David Bowles. Actually, and, and what I'm currently reading, I just started last night, um, Land of Cranes by Aida Salazar. And it is, I can't even talk about it right now. It is just so unspeakably beautiful. It's a, it's a novel, um, it's, it's a verse novel, but, but it's told in short poems, right? So these poems could be written, could, could be read, you know, separate. Yeah. But they form a whole and they tell a story. It's aimed at, at young readers. I believe it's like third grade to seventh grade, but you know, it's, it's, you know young people are engaging with it and, and they love it. But what's really great is um, all poets you know, uh, should, be, should be reading uh, Aida Salazar because she is just a wonderful writer and you know, she's not talking down to kids. You know, she's not, she didn't dumb down you know, her writing uh, for young people. Um, as a prose writer, I'm learning a lot too. It is just beautifully written, and yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's compelling. I wanna as soon as as soon as this finishes, I wanna get back to it. Actually, wow, thank you so much, and thank you again. I really appreciate your time uh, for speaking with us today. Uh, uh, and uh, best of luck with your future endeavors. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, speak on it is a program series connecting teens and authors virtually. Uh, to have a conversation about what speaks to us and inspire us to create. Uh, join us next time as we welcome uh, Lauren Oliver, who is the author of several teen and middle grade uh, series, such as Broken Things, Before I Fall, Delirium, and Panic. Um, and again, thank you all for joining. Uh, until next time. <laughs>